uh, I will begin by just uh, describing a little bit of the journey I had, first of all, through theoretical physics. And at uh, Cambridge, it was part of natural philosophy. And just the very word natural philosophy was uh, understanding that science does give you data, raw data. And one of the things which I got from those years, especially studying theoretical physics, was just how many of my concepts, my ideas, which I thought were common sense, self-evident, turned out to be totally wrong. And just how limited sort of our understanding is of truth. Simply the data overturns much of what I thought was true. And so I further went into more data, especially on the nature of consciousness. And that was uh, my part of meditation, to have personal experience of weird states, which totally <coughs> turned over my idea of what this thing called consciousness and myself really was. And I will give you one little piece of evidence, uh, just which uh, can bust apart ideas of what consciousness and its relation to the body is. Uh, these are all true stories. Uh, one of my disciples in Perth, Western Australia, not in Ontario, he was only an average meditator, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes every day was his max. And one day on a Sunday afternoon, nothing on TV, he went to his bedroom to meditate. And after one and a half hours, two hours, he hadn't come out, so his wife went to go and check on him. And his wife saw him sitting perfectly still in the bedroom, still in his meditation position. Perfectly still. Too still. His chest wasn't moving, and there was no discernible brain. So she rang the emergency number in Australia, 000. Is it 999 here? 911. 911, okay. It's really complicated if you come from overseas and you have an emergency. <laughs> but anyway, she rang the emergency number within about five or ten minutes. The ambulance came with the medics, and they took his pulse. There was no discernible pulse. There was no um, breath discernible. Straight into the ambulance, to the emergency room of our local hospital, uh, where they put an ECG on his body, and it was flat line. More importantly, an EEG, which was also flat line. There's no discernible brain activity at all. Basically, he should be dead. But he was very lucky on that day, there was a... Uh, Indian fellow, and my, his parents had migrated to Australia, and there was an Indian fellow on duty on a Sunday afternoon. And when he heard that uh, this husband had been meditating, he had heard from his parents that it's sometimes possible through deep meditation to suspend such life activities as your heart, breathing, and even brain. And that's what his instruments were showing. So many, many, many times he put on defibrillators to try and stimulate the heart to beat again. Every time, it did not work. Until, as the man told me, he decided it was time to come out of meditation. And as soon as he made that decision, and he opened his eyes, ECG and EEG performed perfectly. And he wondered how on earth he'd got from his home into the hospital, how he'd been manhandled you know, by the medics, how he could not hear the sound of the sirens, and how he could not feel the electric shocks on his own body during this period. And all the time, he was not unconscious. He said he'd never been so aware in his whole life. Just aware of a very beautiful, blissful experience. And unfortunately, that such things aren't recorded. It would be wonderful if that could have happened in a lab. Because what that would have suggested was that there was a case of awareness, consciousness activity when the brain was not functioning at all. And this is a classic Buddhist idea of consciousness is. Instead of calling it consciousness, you know, we change the whole game by saying consciousness is. And the point of meditation in original Buddhism, the earliest form of Buddhism, is, as you were saying, there you are, is to let go enough to be so silent that you become still. And what happens with stillness is that things vanish and disappear. Uh, anecdotes, just in a Zen monastery when I was very young, just meditating with eyes open, watching a wall, a white wall, getting mentally still enough 
not knowing what I was supposed to be doing. And then suddenly, without warning, the wall vanished. It wasn't there anymore. This was a personal experience. And after a while, I realized what was happening. It was just your external senses, such as sight. They are only wired to see things which change. When things are stable, they last a long time, you literally cannot perceive them anymore. Your brain can only notice things which change. The hum of the aircon in this room. Now you can hear it. A few minutes ago you could not. Soon it will disappear again. So the nature of Buddhist meditation is to get so still that things disappear. And you can get into some very weird states. Now once things like five sense consciousnesses disappear, then the next thing you're left with is something happening there. Because here was a guy with no brain activity, no sort of uh, physical activity, perfectly still, but having the time of his life, perfectly aware, coming out afterwards with clear memory of what was happening. It's a case there is another level of consciousness, mind consciousness being totally separate from the other consciousnesses. Now this is something which is data. There are other examples of this. I remember just reading uh, Professor, this is many these things have happened, Professor John Lorber, Sheffield University, in the 1980s was doing research in the shape of the human skull and giving any student he saw on campus you know, a few pounds to join in the experiments. He saw one student with a very deformed skull, invited him into the program, gave him a, a scan of his brain and found what Professor Lorber said, the boy with no brain. 1% cortex, nothing else at all. And he was a graduate first class honours in maths, perfectly normal in every other way, except he did not have a brain. Now, I want to have a little experiment now. So can I ask all of you to move your head from side to side? Can any of you hear any sloshing? If you hear sloshing, then you may be also be a boy or a girl without brain. <laughs> that's what he had inside, cerebral fluid, nothing else. And that challenges the idea that the mind consciousness is something to do with the brain. We have further evidence, such as the near-death experience, research done by people like Professor Pim van Lommel, which is very hard science. People who say that when they had some accident or some operation that they float out of their body and they can see and hear conversations and activities which later proved to be authentic, real. But at the time, their sense, senses are in no position to be able to see or hear such conversations. And indeed, that Pim Van Rommel has shown in his, art, in his article in The Lancet 2001 that the brain was totally dysfunctional. It could not account for that phenomena of real sounds, actions, which were perceived and remembered during a period of lack of brain activity at all. Now I like data. Because one of the things which I learned in science was that one of the foundations of science, Francis Bacon, the founder of the Royal Society in London, that he said that science should never be trying to prove anything. Its job is to disprove theories, to go to any lengths when you have a theory to try and find fault in it. Because you cannot logically prove anything. It means you just haven't found the fault yet but you can disprove something. So he said the only way we can pursue truth in science is to find some anomalies, some extreme situation or circumstances which disprove our normal ideas of the truth of things. And it is true that the meditative experiences of deep meditation, the jhanas, they are weird, they are rare, but they are experiences which are real. Near-death experiences are more common, but they can be measured, they can be quantified, and they can be verified, which means that these are real occasions where consciousness is not a byproduct of the brain. 
I've gone to many universities and people resist that idea. They resist that at all costs. And sometimes I wonder why. And it's because that the way our cognitive processes, which is another part of this uh, talk here, our cognitive processes now, are very conditioned. They're in one particular way. It's the Buddhist teachings, and you mentioned a German word, two German words. Now I'm going to give you a Pali Sanskrit word you can take home with you. And it's a very fascinating area of cognitive processes which people be, do well to research. It's whippalasas. <clears throat> it said you can start, say, with a view. Because I was really concerned. Why do people argue? Why do good people have different views? And it is because we start off with a view. <clears throat> Any of you will do. And then once you have a view, that bends your perception. In other words, anything which challenges that view, fundamentally you will deny, you will you'll say it's not right, you find fault with. Anything which confirms your view, you will allow in and say, yeah, there I was right. Your view condi conditions your thinking. And your thinking conditions your view. There's another factor in there, perception. Condition, uh, so view conditioning your perceptions, perceptions conditioning your thoughts. And the thoughts are the bricks of your views. Now examples of that, people fall in love. That girl is the most beautiful girl in the world. You know, the love changes all the perceptions. You just simply cannot see anything wrong with that person. And you keep thinking about them in a positive way. And the positive thoughts you have about them confirms your view of love, that they're such a wonderful person. A few years later, when you go through divorce, <laughs> the same person, but your view is that they're a terrible person. And your perception, you can only see the perceptions which confirm that view. And you think accordingly, and the thoughts just confirm. Sometimes I wonder, why are there extreme Muslims? Born again Christians. How can a person believe in that? And then the obvious reason is that once you start with a view that say you know, the Bible is correct, absolutely the word of God, then your perceptions will fall into line with your views. Your cognitive processes will subconsciously deny, will not admit into your consciousness anything which challenges that view. And anything which supports that view, you will allow in as proof and evidence. It is the bias of evidential um, proof. Ask any scientist, any anomalous data, this is in physics or science, you will always tend to rub out data in your experiments, in your research, which doesn't prove what you're looking for. And you'll exaggerate data which proves what you want to find. Your, these things happen before, when you're not conscious of it. It changes your perception. And the perception is, the again, the ground of your thoughts, and your thoughts create your views. So you have to be very careful with finding out truth. One of my sayings is never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. Because one of the sayings I remember reading on the wall of Cambridge University you know, when I was a student, the eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time they stop progress in their field. Eminence means that this is the theory, this is right, we don't question it, and that stops progress. The way I was trained as a physicist, as a Buddhist, is question everything, and nothing, nothing at all, is a sacred cow. You have to question everything. And that was what original science was. One of my heroes was a professor of medicine at St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, Sir Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. He's retired maybe 20 years ago now. But in his last year, when he addressed the new intake of medical students, he famously said to the new intake of med students, 50% of what we're going to teach you in the next four years is wrong. My problem is I do not know which 50% it is. <laughs> That's a good scientist. He's a good person. So going back to the nature of consciousness, there we have something where we have data 
raw data, very powerful data, where the consciousness is totally independent of the brain. Why on earth can't people admit that? Why can't they uh, regard things like near-death experiences, the work of Pim Van Rommel or Ian Stevenson, and people who can remember previous lives? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is because there's a saying in science, maybe in philosophy, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. You heard that before? But who decides what's extraordinary claims? It's the people who want to defend their turf, the ones who say that consciousness, say, is just a part of the brain. And in order to, to preserve that type of view and idea, they are the ones who say anything which is a bit controversial, which is groundbreaking, which is seeing things in a new light. That's extraordinary. And so we're going to set the bar so high that it cannot be proved. That is bad science. That is not good philosophy. It is just bending the truth to fit oneself. So I don't know what extraordinary claims are and who decides what's extraordinary and what's acceptable. And I think the bar of evidence should be equal to whatever sort of science or philosophy is proposed to people. And if that is the case, you will have to admit, well, I hope you would admit, that things like the mind, consciousness, is totally separate from the brain. It is not a, an object, not a sort of a byproduct, but an every phenomenon of the human brain. That opens up, of course, another whole area of the existence of a human being. Now, are we just a human being? Or is, as they say in Buddhism, that this is the driver coming into a new car when you get reborn? Consciousness existing outside of life. And indeed, there is one of my good friends from Cambridge, I'll be seeing him in about a week or two's time, and his daughter too, and his daughter was only six years of age. She was asked in first grade at school, what is the biggest thing in the world? Now, one child put their hand up and said, my daddy, six-year-old. Another child put their hand up and said, an elephant. Another one said, a mountain. And the daughter of my friend, she put her hand up and said, my eye is the biggest thing in the world. No one understood what she meant, and she was asked to explain. And I would add that this little girl is now doing post-grad research, I think post-PhD research in Oxford, in biochemistry. Absolutely brilliant girl, even at the age of six. And when I asked, what do you mean, my eye is the biggest thing in the world? She said, well, my eye can see a mountain, you can see her daddy, you can see an elephant, you can see so much more. In fact, it's, uh, my eye can see so much. If all of that can fit into my eye, my eye must be the biggest thing in the world. What she was doing was changing a framework and getting a very good answer. The, the eye must be the biggest thing in the world because everything can fit in. And when my friend wrote to me, I said 9 out of 10, but not 10 out of 10, because your consciousness, your mind consciousness, could see everything which your eye can see, can hear everything you can hear with your ears, can smell, can taste, can touch, and it has its own area of knowledge, your mental phenomena. You can know anger, depression, you can know love, you can know fear, doesn't exist in the body, that exists in the world of the mind. You can know so much, in fact, everything that can ever be experienced can fit into your mind. Therefore, the mind is not the biggest thing in the world, because you can know the world, it's the biggest thing the world can fit in to the mind. That's a way of looking, and it's as, as rational, as defendable, as any other way of looking. It's a good way of perceiving things. And it's also a very helpful way of perceiving things according to Buddhism. That's classical Buddhism. The whole universe fits in to the mind. The mind is primal. And everything else follows afterwards. And I was very pleased when I was doing theoretical physics to see the primacy of the mind in quantum physics. It is Schrodinger's equation. The first time that observation was shown to create reality. Fundamentally, 
the old conundrum. Tree falls in a forest, if no one is there to see it, has it fallen? Quantum physics says it hasn't fallen, it hasn't not fallen. It's just a probability, a potential, it's neither one nor the other. And that is more fundamental reality than the one which we see and perceive every day. Perception changes reality. When we see something, we change it. When we hear it, it's one of many possibilities and this is the one we hear. It is the mind creates the world in a fundamental way. You know, one of the, many of the times when I was looking at science, when I was in the lecture theatres, I was standing back, I couldn't take notes anymore, because this was totally changing the way I looked at things. If there's anything in life you should learn at a university, it's actually to change the way you think, fundamentally, totally, to turn you upside down. If there's going to be any motto for a university, it should be where everybody, where anyone thinks the same. So where everybody thinks the same, where everybody thinks the same, no one thinks at all. That's why universities should challenge you. Not say what you want to, to hear, but say what you don't want to hear. To face you with ideas of the consciousness and its primacy, for example, and ask for that to be disproved. I'm not going to speak for very long. Thank you for listening.